For over half a century, the question of who built the old stone ruins of the East has been the most controversial mystery in American anthropology. Today, these priceless archaeological resources represent a radical new vision of the past. They have become signposts pointing toward the discovery of an unknown chapter in the history of ancient Native America. When 18th and 19th century antiquarian scholars discovered stone ruins in the eastern landscape, they dreamt about lost races, cultures that were well beyond the technical capabilities of the historical Indians they were familiar with. They also imagined migration or cultural diffusion from the old world. Egyptians, Phoenicians, the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel, Celtic Druids, Vikings, and Irish monks all filled a vacuum created by our inadequate knowledge of the cultural landscape. For most professional researchers, the only acceptable explanation for the stone ruins is that they were built by later European colonists, the only societies who supposedly had both the ability and the interest. But how much do we really understand about the ancient ancestral cultures of Eastern North America? Unfortunately, our textbooks have left us with a meager image of Eastern native life. And when you carry that anthropological model further back in time, the Western scientific vision of Ice Age America evolves down to a generalized assumption that 10,000 years ago, these people were among the most primitive hunting and gathering societies on Earth. All right, welcome everyone uh, to the, uh, let's see, I guess this would be the second event for September 2021. Um, it's the um, first in a three-part series um, on Indigenous Matters for Hadley Learns. And uh, a little bit of introduction for Hadley Learns. Uh, this is um, the, I think it's the 14th uh, monthly event that we've held since last spring um, at the start of a lot of uh, racial awareness and, about inequity in our nation and in our society and a small group of community members came together and really wanted to lean in and learn what was it that was at the heart of these inequities um, and so we've been learning none of us are experts we choose a topic uh, uh, identify a resource that's very highly acclaimed um, and we um, learn together and come discuss oftentimes in small groups never recorded except unless we have a rock star speaker come join us. Like tonight, we have Ted Timrick. Um, and uh, we um, will continue to do this forever into the future. And we welcome you to join us um, in planning and thinking about it. Um, so tonight's event um, uh, is brought to you by a special collaboration, a first time collaboration with the Hadley Public Libraries, um, as well as the Committee on Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. Um, we'd also like, and also the Hadley Public Schools. We'd love to thank the Senior Center and the friends of the Senior Center who made their facilities available to us when we showed uh, Hidden Falls, um, the Hidden Landscapes, the Great Falls movie in person, uh, in real life, uh, right outside the Senior Center on a beautiful night earlier this month. Um, our team has purchased access to the movie for you. So if you're watching this at home or later uh, this week, uh, know that you can go to hadleylearns.com and uh, simply register in the events section and ask us for the movie and we'll send you the link by email. It's an incredible movie and something you really need to watch. Um, just makes you think and uh, makes you makes you realize that there's uh, some pretty incredible resources and, and history right under our nose. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Tony Lynn Morelli, who um, worked um, uh, really hard to bring this program to life. Thank you, Tony, and also Mara Breen and Jay Nevinsmith. Um, for all your work on this program. Tony Lynn, take it away. Thank you, Mara. Uh, I just wanna start with a land acknowledgement um, and I will 
introduce the land acknowledgement by acknowledging that um, land acknowledgements are um, becoming more popular. They are also um, have a complicated view in the indigenous community, depending on who you ask. It's not a perfect solution, but it feels particularly relevant tonight. And one of the reasons that sometimes land acknowledgements are considered to be um, not the best tool for um, acknowledging the, the history and um, injustice around indigenous peoples in our country and around the world is that they're often used alone and out of context of topic. But this feels particularly um, relevant tonight because um, this is the first of our three um, fo focused events, actually four events on indigenous rights, history, current events, uh, culture, and kind of action that we're doing this fall. And so it feels like a good time to have a land acknowledgement. I feel like we are doing the work along with the words. Um, Buildings in Hadley uh, were founded and built on the unceded homelands of the Kumtuk Nation on the land of Nuwadek community. We begin tonight with gratitude for nearby waters and lands. We recognize these lands and waters as important relations with which we are all interconnected and depend on to sustain life and well being. The Kumtuk had connections with these lands for millennia. Over 400 years of colonization, when the Kuntuk peoples were displaced, many joined their Algonquian relatives to the east, south, west, and north. That includes Mashpee, Anakina Wampanoag, Nipmuc, Narragansett, Mohegan, Pequot, Mohican communities, and Abenaki and other nations of the Wabanaki Confederacy. These native people still maintain connections and relationships of care for these lands today. And as an active step, first step towards decolonization, we are encourage you to learn more about the native nations whose homelands Hadley as a town and we as people here now reside on and the indigenous homelands on which we live and work. So that's part of what we're doing exactly tonight, having uh, Mr. Timrak with us here. Since the mid 1970s, Ted Timrak has specialized in portraits of artists for PBS and anthropological programming for the Smithsonian Institution. He holds a research position at the National Museum of Natural History in the Anthropology Department. And he has worked extensively with Smithsonian scientists documenting field research producing video and electronic media for the National Museum, along with independent programming for public and cable television. He's the producer of the Smithsonian's Arctic Studi Studies website. Television works include Franz Boas for the PBS Odyssey series, along with the Lost Red Paint People and Vikings in America for PBS. He's a recipient of the Peabody Award and his television portraits of artists. PBS National Specials and American Master Series includes include Charles Ives, Thomas Eakins, Augustus St. Gaudens, and Frederick Law Olmsted. Recently, he has completed a multi-part series called uh, Hidden Landscapes that tells the story of early Eastern Native American sea cultures and offers a radical perspective on the ancient history of North America. So we are talking about that first movie in that series tonight. And I uh, want to remind you that there are other films in that series. Um, that you can go check out as well. So Ted, we're very happy for you to be with us today. We thought maybe, I, maybe that you could just start telling us a little bit about what caused you to focus on this topic of um, the history around this area and um, Turner's Falls, Great Falls in particular. Sure. Um, about mid seventies, 75, 76, uh, I had just finished uh, the, the first um, TV show that I had gotten to produce and direct. And I was very fortunate. It, it won a Peabody. It was a portrait of Charles Ives. And that gave me some latitude and some chances to do things that, uh, that I wanted to. And uh, 
In that same period, some of you might know this book that came out uh, by this uh, Harvard uh, professor uh, of marine biology by the name of Barry Fell. And in this book, he portrayed these mysterious stone ruins in New England. Now, there had been um, a good 30, 40 years of antiquarian research into these things before he came out with the book. And he didn't know anything about them himself. He simply uh, went to these uh, people who, who really knew the woods well and uh, documented what they had discovered and put it in a book. Now, the real key of that is that his theory was that all of these stone ruins were built by um, Europeans, uh, diffusion, Phoenicians, Egyptians. Um, and uh, when I got my hands on the book, I looked at these things and uh, the idea that our background in New England had all of these archeological ruins that people were seriously arguing about, uh, vehemently arguing about, uh, got a filmmaker's interest, you know, that's just the kind of thing because the amateur antiquarians who were discovering these things were, were jumping up and down saying they're very important. And the professional archeologists said, no, these are nothing, they're just field clearing. And there was so much vehemence between the, the amateurs and the professionals that any journalist would realize there had to be something interesting going on if people are willing to kill themselves over these <laughs> strange stone ruins um, that nobody seemed to be able to figure out. So uh, I went to work with a, another researcher, a, a wonderful character by the name of Will Getzman, who was probably one of the best researchers I've ever uh, worked with. He, he went on to, uh, at Yale, be, be uh, in charge of his own international finance uh, wing uh, in the school, uh, international business. But at the time, his first degree was in archaeology. I had just done the film business. I was, I was coming along pretty uh, fairly. And we set out to look into this problem. And, the, and what we did is we went and skipped Dr. Fell and went straight to the people who he had gotten his information from. And for me, this was an introduction to a very strange breed of wonderful characters who knew the woods. They tramped through the woods all the time. They were everything from, from um, part-time archeologists to full-time dowsers to just a, a conglomeration of people that you don't imagine uh, would ever be taken seriously. So, um, I followed them around for quite a while, and we realized within a short amount of time that these things could not be made by Phoenicians or, or Egyptians. There's simply no archaeology. There was no trace of any of that kind of European archaeology uh, underneath these kinds of things. The only thing that was there were traces of Native American um, archaeological resources. And those kinds of things were ignored by the professionals, and they were also ignored by the amateurs who were enthralled with this romantic idea of diffusion because America has been enthralled with the idea of diffusion since Columbus, almost. It, 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 it was a national, for years and years, it was a national way for us to see who we were. And it's taken this 400 years of colonization to come around to the point where we're willing to look at who we are based on the real history underneath. We'll get to that. Um, but I spent from 1975 to 1980 building up, going into the woods and documenting these sites and the people who had discovered them. When we realized that it couldn't have been, as Dr. Fell had suggested, uh, the Phoenicians and what have you. We realized it could have been Native America and that Native American. And that led us to the Smithsonian, where we went down and said, look, do you, we went to uh, a, a scientist by the name of Bill Fitzhugh, who was the head of the Arctic Studies Center. And we said, do you have, have you discovered anything that would be interesting along these lines that we could, would make sense to us uh, 
since we're at this impasse of all of these people, the professionals hating the amateurs and the amateurs hating the professionals. Um, and he said, well, yes, we, we, we find stone ruins all the time. And we're just developing, we've been for a few years, we've been going to Northern Labrador and finding these stone ruins. And we know that they're Native American. And would you like to come along and uh, film? And of course we did. We went up there. When we got to the, just below the Arctic Circle in a place called Nuliak Cove, uh, they had burial mounds of stone that covered 4,000 year old burials of Native Americans for sure. And they had chambers built out of stone that you absolutely could know weren't built by colonial farmers because uh, there's a scene I shot where Dr. Fitzhugh bends down and takes, uh, or there's, there's no foliage, there's a few lichens on the ground up here, right? And he pulls a point, uh, a, a spear point, or uh, for the most part, up off the ground, and it's been there for 4,000 years. And there haven't been any colonial farmers in this area at all. So we were absolutely sure that we were looking at Native stuff. The ceremonial stuff was like native ceremonial stuff uh, from a thousand or 3000 years later in the mound builders and all of these places. Now, a little aside, that first movie about that, those discoveries is called The Mystery of the Lost Red Paint People. It was on Nova and um, you can get that. It, it isn't actually on my website, unfortunately. <laughs> but it's available in different places and I can, I can work that out with you. But the discovery of native ceremonial sites um, convinced me that we were on the right track, that the argument did have uh, some, some meat underneath. And it sent me to find native resource people, pre preservation professionals, who could talk to us about these things, who were willing to talk to us because many, many native people didn't wanna talk about these and they wanted to keep these sites secret uh, and for very understandable reasons. But what I recognized at that point was that development in our New England area, they are developing anything. All of the, back, the backwoods areas that used to be left alone or maybe um, logged, we're now turning into wonderful home sites with great views. Uh, and it just so turns out that these are also the kinds of environmental places that native people also understood had great views and resources and things like that. So now, even though many people, both antiquarians and natives wanted to keep these sites secret to protect them, uh, we recognize that they weren't being protected. The developers were just scavenging for great sites and destroying any piles of stone that they happened to find where they wanted to put a basement. That's where I met Doug Harris, who you met in the movie. And just as a quick question, has everybody uh, seen the film or are there people that still want to see the film? Or just so I have a sense of how much background you've got. Is there any way for us to know this or me to know this? You could uh, drop, drop your name in the chat window if you've saw, seen the film or just a note. Just a simple hand wave. You know, you know, I'm, Del, I'm, Del has. That's and, great. Okay. Sarah, yeah, and most of us, I think. Okay, fine. I just didn't want to be, you know, spouting on here about blank slates. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, uh, at that point, I got together with Doug Harris, who that was more than 20 years ago. And we have worked together steadily ever since. Uh, and as you can tell from the movie, the thoughtfulness and the balance and the correct politics that he has offered to us in that film are the way he really follows through, through on these things. I've only met a few Native people who really, truly balance their tradition and science in a way that makes sense and is politically stable and workable in our culture. Uh, it's a gift to have that. I think Doug Harris is somebody who really has that ability. And uh, so I made 
uh, four films with him. The, the uh, Great Falls is the first one. And uh, if you go to the site, you'll see that there are three more that mm. follow on the introduction that Great Falls represents and the rest of the movies build out uh, not only about the environmental ceremonialism that I think is important to all of us. Be, and we can talk about this because our environmentalism is full of science and short on emotion except for panic. So something that you can learn from the native perspective on this environment is to add an emotional segment to our whole issue of environmental protection. And that is something that in the future will add some depth that we can all share in. But um, so those, just so you know, those other movies will expand out on what the introduction gave us. That, it, so it took, it took maybe 10 years, seven, eight, 10 years to film all of this stuff, all of these discoveries and the politics, to get the politics right around them. That led us to what you saw as the introduction to um, um, Hidden Landscapes. We can break here and we can go to your next question or what have you. That was terrific. Thank you. Um, uh, Mara, do you have a question you'd like to ask? I think Mara did. Mara. Yeah, so I'm up next. Um, so I guess, were there any challenges that you encountered during the production and that and that might mean in terms of accessing these sites or you know you said you were already in touch with groups who were maybe protective of them was that challenging in the context of production or um you know any of the other encounters with say other academics were yeah were there challenges around these ideas um in the that? whole thing is fraught because the first thing that the movie says is that for the last 50 years these stone ruins have been one of the most intense controversies in North American archaeology. It is still uh, a huge debate uh, and struggle, mostly because of the pressure of land development and preservation. And the, that, that's the underlying uh, real cause, I believe. Then you uh, palimpsest over that, uh, all kinds of scientific uh, perfection, native tradition, and arguments that are here and there and important and unimportant, but they're, to me, they're all covering the question of preservation in some way or another. Now, specifically, okay, when I started working at the Smithsonian, um, I don't have the education in anthropology that one would have to have the position that they have given me very kindly. I do have the education in design and communication and film, you know, right up to Columbia graduate school, blah, blah. But I could partner with them and always learn from the science. However, the Smithsonian, as you can imagine, even though they were discovering these amazing things, is bottom line a very conservative institution, uh, sometimes worthily detested for what they've done over X number of years. But my own personal take on this is that the scientists that are in the trenches in an institution like the Smithsonian are incredible workers. They are the, the best value for our tax dollars I think I've seen short of potholes. Uh, when you get to the, the higher ups and the, the political side of the institution, then you're just talking some chaos. But the, really, the real scientists who are in the trenches are discovering incredible things. And the thing about the Smithsonian is it's not an academic um, uh, function. You don't have to um, uh, publish or perish. OK, you do your research and you you do you do write it up, but you, there's no pressure to to put it out there in such a way that uh, 
that it, it has to be there. And I think that those scientists, as good as they are, uh, take advantage of that slight loophole so that we really don't know the amazing things that these guys and women are discovering. It ju they just don't put it out there. When I approached them about the movies and we basically became friends, I was, I was at this in Nuliak Cove on a raised beach terrace, 80 feet above the ocean, which this terrace was once the, where all the Indians lived at the water's edge, right? And we were sitting there, Fitzhugh and I, and he said, you know, the only, the only question here is where did these people come from? He knows more about that than anybody else. But he's never written that kind of thing into peer-reviewed scientific papers. He has all this information. But what he has done is given it to me in interviews, which are um, informal. They're not peer-reviewed. And the beauty of it is, as you've seen to a certain extent, is when scientists are in a movie, they can, if you, if you, if you direct it properly, they can be themselves. They, you as a viewer can get a sense of who they are and, and the screens and, the, and all these things and, and, the, and, the, and the truthfulness. There's, there's so much you learn by watching them tell you something as opposed to reading the peer reviewed paper that comes out in all of that language that nobody gets anyway. And not only that, only 10 people are going to read it. And more than half of the people who read it are going to hate you for what you wrote. And that's all given and understood. But I thought, and I felt over the 45 years that I've been working there, that when these scientists gave interviews, everything that was there to point to what they'd like to have you think about without them forcing themselves to go into a situation where everybody's going to jump down their throat for their, their radical ideas. Now, I brought all of this up because I've been there for over 45 years now, and I have always worried about, would they let me go because, because I was too much on the fringe? In other words, I had to be careful not to create a place where I was going into some avenue that would jeopardize the, the resources that I was working so closely with. Now, I've worked with many departments in the Smithsonian, from physical anthropology to paleo to Arctic to um, the websites, and found that frankly, that they would let me take these edges, take these fringe edges, trusting that I would listen to everybody and find a balance. And then when I could go out and get federally recognized native um, preservation professionals to join me and take take the, the wording of what those things are if from their point of view, and I didn't have to do that with the narration. It lifted the whole thing up because the one thing the Smithsonian does do or tries to pride themselves, at least most of the scientists in the anthropology department work hard to work with um, native uh, representatives to keep the whole idea of anthropology alive. And it's not easy. Uh, and it goes up and down and, and it's there, we've got 500 years of cultural strife and it's never going to clear up in our lifetimes, but it is improving uh, as we speak. Enough said. So that's the first level of trouble <laughs> that you have to face. How do we get these ideas out with an imprimatur from a position at the Smithsonian and yet have it so much on the edge that a whole slew of other professionals are going to hate you. But these aren't, these, these, these movies aren't in peer reviewed um, scientific forums. And yet my, you know, my father um, in the middle of this, I once uh, introduced him to Ken Burns, probably a mistake, but afterwards he, he said, he asked me, he says, why do you make these movies that only 12 people are interested in? And the only thing I could say to him was, you know, it all depends on who those 12 people are. 
I had no other way because th these are not big audience movies, as, as you can all tell. Uh, but it's worth it to me to try to raise enough money to make the film so that the scientists and the native tribal people and people like yourselves who are very interested in understanding what, how deep these histories are and how it influences us today that most people don't know. That's a big enough audience as far as I'm concerned. And it's probably the most important audience because how, what, you, you've seen the movie, you're not going to put that in the theater. It's just, it's just not going to fly. It's really complicated. And it's probably hard to believe in many cases. Uh, so that's the next level of trouble. Uh, then, it, then, it, then there are individual cases, but I, I have been very fortunate in, I've never, I, I don't think there's any scientist who's ever told me he wouldn't appear in the movie if I asked him for an interview. So they know, um, A, they know nobody's going to see it. <laughs> so they're safe. Uh, and B, they often have wonderful ideas about native history uh, that, that they're not gonna put out there for the rest of the profession to chew up. Now, quick background. I, you probably already uh, understand this, but ceremonial landscapes from uh, pyramids, uh, Aztec and Inca pyramids to the mound builders of the Midwest, to the Southeastern mound builders, to the great poverty point, Mississippian stuff, to, to South America, won't even leave, just North America. The entire country is layered with ceremonial landscapes by native people in different groups at different times going back to the ice age. The problem has always been that the Northeast, New England, our little roots, our little back, you know, that Connecticut River and, and spreading out from there has never been recognized as a place where Native American people were sophisticated enough to create ceremonial landscaping because it didn't seem to be on the scale of the Aztec and Inca empires or the great mound builders of the Middle West or that kind of thing. Uh, and that goes back to, I would say, the first Puritans who came and their take on the native people was that they weren't sophisticated enough to deserve the rights to their own land, simply put. Now, that's a, a subtle way. There may not have been wholesale extermination like there were in other parts of the country in New England, but there was an ignoring of culture for the first 400 years of colonization, especially when you consider that the first scientific anthropological um, schools happened to be Harvard and Yale. These, this is where scientific anthropology began in our country. And it spread out from there to other schools, other places slowly. But Harvard and Yale were primarily Puritan-based educational institutions. So they carried on the original um, Puritan traditions that were developed from the first colonists uh, in terms of their... Um, understanding of the original natives. So it's a double whammy. Um, we, we do have uh, several uh, reservations in New England, which was, you know, more enlightened than many places. But at this, by the same token, we don't have any recognition of any culture uh, like in other places that where it's much heavier. That, I think that goes back to another one of your problems in making the movie. How do you get an audience to completely change their vision of Native Americans from uh, headdress, feathers, teepees, um, Sioux Plains Indian models to something where 
and you, you can see this in the rest of the movies as it develops, we're talking about people who lived along the Atlantic coast at the, at the, at the end, you could say the end of the ice age, but they lived well through the ice age. They had 80 man canoes that they, that they built and launched uh, and went up and down the East coast from the Caribbean to the Arctic. Now you go, Oh, wow. An 80 man canoe. That's a big boat. And so you get out on the ocean. What I've discovered that audiences sometimes don't put together is the fact that an 80 man canoe is not a unique little piece. Think about what you need for a culture that can navigate an 80 man canoe on an ocean. The social structure that you have to have and the communication you have to have and the relationship between multiple tribes connected by water in order to make an 80 man canoe a worthwhile thing. Check your textbooks. The biggest canoe you'll see is, you know, 20, 20 men. Um, but um, the first governor, I guess his name is Winthrop from Connecticut. He said there were 80 man canoes. Indians built 80 man canoes. Uh, unfortunately, I would think that a, a native canoe that held 80 men would be a seriously easy target for a, a 16th or 17th century cannon on a boat. And I get the feeling that we don't have much record of these boats. Uh, but we do have these little bits and pieces that have been written down. And then scientists and historians after thought, these people could never build an 80 man canoe. They couldn't even have a, a log big enough for an 80 man canoe. And I, I, that troubled me for a decade or so until I ran into a, another researcher uh, by the name of uh, Tom Wessels, who is uh, a forest, uh, New England forest. He came out of Antioch. And he pointed out to me that if you have a ravine, a deep ravine, as we do in New England in many places, and the ravine is uh, 40, 50 feet uh, below a, a, the glacial surface, you know, it's a ravine cut by a glacier and there's, and the forest goes up 40, 50 feet and then you have more forest. The, the trees that grow in those ravines will grow as tall as the trees that um, are on the, at the next level. All canopy goes to the same height in order to get the sun. So he felt and knew that there was no problem getting really large, large wooden uh, uh, tree trunks to make an 80 man canoe. So that part, that part of the problem was, like, but I, I'd like to impress on you again, the fact that it's not just an 80 man canoe, it's the society that can handle the, the use and development and launching of an 80 man canoe and then running it and how far you were going to go. Certainly they 4,000 years ago, they were going up to uh, Nuliak Cove uh, just below the Arctic circle, uh, big ice year round, all that, all that kind of thing. That's another big problem. How do you convince the audience that to change their image of what an in, what an East Coast Indian is. The film that, the last film I did uh, for this whole series is called the, um, uh, Native, the, the Native Sea Peoples of the North Atlantic. And what that movie is, is a, a look at all of the civilizations around the ice covered rim of the North Atlantic this is during the ice age from 25,000 years ago uh, when ice, there was a bridge of ice from Northern Europe to Long Island. And there were civilizations that developed uh, ocean going capabilities through the ice age. Also, many of you probably know, there is uh, a shelf, a continental shelf off the Atlantic coast that extends about out in into the ocean. 
Now this shelf, it's, it's very shallow actually. And during the last ice age, when the ice absorbed all the water into the, into the glaciers, that 400 miles of land was dry. It had rivers running through it, it had animals, and scientists like Bill Fitzhugh and other Smithsonian scientists are absolutely sure that humans would, could not resist the uh, resources that the ocean gives you. Everywhere on earth, people who live next to the ocean have a better life than the people who don't. They use the resources. Nobody can ignore the resources that the ocean offers. And uh, it's just, it, it's adaptation to the ocean and to navigation started somewhere before 60,000 years ago. Now these numbers get thrown by different scientists into different places at di in different times. It's for our purpose, it serves that the, the land was out there. People were on that shore. They were adapted to the ocean uh, at least 20 to 30,000 years ago. So the last film this, that I've just been mentioning to you ends with a very recent discovery. As a matter of fact, just last October, uh, Smithsonian scientists uncovered uh, points, native points, on the coast of the Delmarva Peninsula, about the level of Washington, D.C., on the Atlantic Ocean, the, in two places. They went, um, they went uh, about 40 miles off the coast at, in a scallop, um, yeah, a scallop dredge. They pulled, accidentally pulled up the skull of a mastodon, and in the skull was a biface blade. And it came from 200 miles up the Chesapeake River. At the, and, but that was a very controversial thing you may have heard about. But it was a very interesting thing. Don, Dennis Stanford is the guy who brought that out. Uh, at the same time, um, it, well, a couple of years later, uh, along the shore of the, of the Delmarva Peninsula, another blade from the, of the same kind of blade was uh, actually found in situ, eroding out of a bank, and that proved to be uh, about 27,000 years ago. Now, in a nutshell, that's almost twice as long as our textbooks are telling us human beings were even here in North America. So we got problems. We are, we're, we're, we're in this, the East has never, is, it, it's always been people walking over from Siberia and coming from West to East uh, and always late. Uh, now we've got dates that are trickling in that just don't fit any of our models and it's wreaking havoc with the profession. Even though there's, there's some talk, but nobody wants to get really um, too crazed about this because it, it really is sublimated uh, for as they build more and more proof slowly the way these good scientists do. They don't want to get emotional. They don't want to turn it into TV, although it's leaking in there. I mean, I'm an example of that myself. So, you know, what are you going to do? You, people won't need to know these things, uh, but scientists are always going to be trying to stay steps ahead. But th like I say, this, these discoveries were really um, solidified only last October. And I managed to end the, my last movie with those discoveries. And who knows what's next? I may be too old to keep it going myself, but young people coming after me are going to have a lot more to work with than I did at the time. So does that bring us to some kind of an answer to your question? Yeah, that was really excellent. So much more than I was expecting. But I think if you're paying attention to the chat, people's minds are just being blown. Um, by if I were to do that, I... Yeah, right. <laughs> yes, yes, I understand. It's just, right, this is exciting information um, for people to hear this. Um, so I think that actually then kind of leads naturally to another question, which is what kind of reception have, have all of these components of, or these different, we would call them chapters of the Hidden Landscapes uh, series, what kind of reception have you gotten? And do you think that um, that this the, the small audience that is seeing these um, films, what kind of momentum is building from that? And how do you think that's feeding back to the sort of scientific investigation of the history of these areas? 
Well, that's a good question. Um, I've been after on this for 45 years, just with the Smithsonian. There was, a, there was a time when I was just floundering around in New England with these stones, wondering what on earth was going on. You know, were they really Druids and, and Celts and all of that? We had to clear ourselves of that first. We had to get a, a, we had to get a native component just to begin to look at the history. Um, in, in general, the movies I've made only go to scientists, specialists, and people like yourselves who get brought in because they've got the knowledge that it takes to understand how complicated our history really is and how different it is from the way the textbooks have laid it out based on the need admittedly racist, to make sure that Native Americans, it's, it's always been our 400 years of trying to make sure that they were really late comers, that they haven't been here very long. And they didn't get where we are <laughs> until much, 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 much later. They had to walk all across, although no one's quite explained how it could be so fast, right? how they could get all the way down to South America and all the way to Labrador or New, even New England in such a short span. It's, it's just, it's been unrealistic and it's just something they just keep saying it's, that's what happened. But it's probably not what happened. It's probably infinitely more co complicated. The levels of civilization are much more complex than we ever let on. But I, I don't try to make myself into um, a native expert at all. Uh, so I can't, I don't want to speak for natives. I mean, as you saw, Doug Harris is so good at bringing those elements together in a way that is non-confrontational and inviting at the same time. He's extraordinary at that. Um, but somebody had, some, a filmmaker had to get the real people because you couldn't write this in a book. It just wouldn't hold. You have to actually see the people talking to you. You have to see their sides and, and judge for yourselves what, how realistic these people are. You know, are we, are they crazies? Are they mad people? Are they, they come from the moon. The audience has to decide that. But getting the scientists who uh, know this stuff and are willing to talk about it is not an easy thing to do because it's been so controversial for so long that every good scientist approaches it with caution right off the bat. We've seen th th this, for some reason, the subject of native history in its relation to uh, non-native history is fraught. And the depth of native history in the new world, excuse me, uh, is something that it's been important to not develop, even though our science is working very hard at developing it. This vestige of everything coming over from uh, Siberia, if you will, is so deeply ingrained that um, it has shaped unconsciously, it has shaped all the rest of our histories. So the simple consequence is, is that any people who actually made it to the Atlantic Ocean from Alaska or Siberia must have been, A, pushed out <laughs> for some reason by other people. They must have been the either the frontier or the reject element from this onslaught of Native America coming from Asia. It's very clear to our historical record that all of the civilization is in the West, it's on the, on the Pacific, it's in the, 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 all of those magnificent civilizations. But it turns out that the absolute earliest burial mound in North America so far, and this could change, of course, is on the Atlantic coast of Labrador, 
at a place called Lanza Moor. It's 7,500 to maybe 8,000 years old. It's at the, it's in the mouth of the Gulf of St. Lawrence. How? <laughs> if, you, if you just take that fact and try to factor it in with all the rest of the history that our textbooks give us, you've got lots and lots of problems. And the, the, the really dedicated East Coast professional archaeologists understand that they're up against this wall of information, of tradition, scientific tradition, uh, Puritan tradition, uh, all of American history tradition that makes Eastern Indians somehow uh, less than the sophistication you would find everywhere from Aztec to Navajo to, to the West Coast to the mound builders of the Middle West. But the mounds in Labrador on the coast of the Atlantic are much, much earlier, no less uh, complete in their structure. They may not be multiple tiers, but they're thousands of years earlier. We just haven't figured out how this can be yet. But it certainly ought to lead us to have open minds about um, the history we don't know or we haven't figured it out yet. But East Coast Native history is, there's a lot of black hole for us to work on. The short answer to your question is, very, very few people have seen these movies. Very few people. Um, the ones who have uh, are, are, are quite dedicated and, and they're usually researchers who have their own depth of research themselves, specializing in other areas, but it, it comes together with a, a synthesis that we have tried to lay out. If you see the other three films or four films or five that are in this works, uh, you'll see connections on, on many, many different levels to what we don't know. Tons and tons that we just haven't put into our textbooks about Native America and it's the East. We just don't understand what, Eastern Na what the history of Eastern Native America is, despite what our textbooks are telling us it is. So it's gonna take another generation or two after I'm gone and after we're gone um, to put all these things in place. And it, I'm sure it will happen. It's just a question of time, but you can't do this in, in one, in anybody's single lifetime. But the antiquarians who have pointed the way in New England, especially, and they've been crying in the wilderness for many, many years here. Um, they did plant the seeds and it eventually merged with native peoples who were willing to uh, search in their own past and um, give pieces of their own past to the public in such a way because they see that past vanishing, whereas it's all in, it's been in the backwoods. These these stone ruins have been out there for the most part ignored or given the wrong interpretations. And for many Native people, that was okay. But now we're losing them, and so to lose them is the worst thing that could happen. Uh, they could be misinterpreted. They have been misinterpreted, but even a misinterpretation puts it on some map somewhere and that's all we can hope so that they don't get plowed all get plowed under and built over before they've even been recognized but the movie hasn't been seen the movies haven't been seen i'm lucky i i hold a position at the smithsonian so i can do these things and i mean i've had stuff on nova and and things like that but once we lift it off into this realm of um really controversial if you want to look at it that way. Um, I don't have the resources to reach larger audiences. I don't even have the inclination to want to reach larger audiences. Uh, I have been very, very lucky. I, I work with these scientists. They keep me posted. They invite me to their places. I can document these things. And I've got more information to put together than 
I have time to go into the business of distribution. That doesn't mean distributors don't have these things. Uh, they don't have all of them at all, especially the more recent ones uh, in the last couple of years. But that's when I had to hurry up and finish this stuff. I mean, after being on it for since 1975 myself, uh, it's taken a, a whole lifetime. But, you know, I got to say that the Smithsonian has never kicked me out. And that's been the lucky part of the whole thing. And, and the Native people have allowed me, because of that connection to the Smithsonian, for the most part, Native people, at least uh, Native people from official uh, tribes, have been willing to cross these boundaries uh, if one is respectful, respectful in all directions. I'm not sure I answered that very well, but uh, there's a lot of information in there. No, no, I, I think, yeah, I appreciate your you clarifying the, the, the challenges around, you know, the, the real challenge, I think, for the, for the Native groups to think about, do they want these publicized versus, right, and that, and that fundamental lost. challenge, right, if it's about trying to save them. Yeah, yeah. And see I see what the problem is. Yeah. So many yeah. of these sites, as you saw in the movie, are way back tucked up in the hills on, on land that's, that hasn't been touched. But now all those places we've discovered are wonderful environmental um, places to build your house or whatever. And, and so they're all under stress in many cases. Yeah. Well, but I also, yeah. And I appreciate, you know, you tying that in with these much larger questions and sort of area, which is mind blowing to me, right? As someone who has only read the books about everybody walking across the land bridge from Siberia. Yeah. So. I'll, I'll defer. I think Humera's got the next question. Well, I, I just want to, um, you, you said that you were lucky to be connected with the Smithsonian. Indeed you were, but we, we are lucky that you um, like persevered despite the, the pushback and the prevailing wisdom and the, and the, you know, uh, that backdrop of people, you know, going against what is commonly understood to imagine this new possibility and to do it for so many years and to bring this story to light um, with, you know, small groups of people uh, watching. I, I think you'll probably go down in the history books at some point as the person oh, no. who, who kept it going and really, you know, brought people together, made these connections um, and was that that storyteller that uh, brought that to light? Um, I think, in a sense, we um, getting getting the story or the ideas more broadly known might bring it in the realm of you know uh, even fiction. If if you had people writing about what could have been like a little black black planther, like if you will, you know, imagine if there was this whole other tale, this whole other story uh, that might bring it to the realm of possibility. Well, of course, for the, the people who were on this land to have survived as long as they did and thrived, they must have had their, you know, technology of navigation, of, um, of, of survival, of, of boat building and, and uh, transport. Um, and that's, well, thank you for helping us imagine that too. Um, at this, I think we covered the the question, the broadly speaking, the questions that we had for you. Uh, you know, in terms of like, how did that land? I think one more question that we had, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. And, and folks, you, this chat has been incredible, amazing resources that you've shared. If you have questions for Ted, get them ready, drop them in the chat. We're going to be turning to you next. Um, you, you talked about some of the the, um, the response to the film, but what's happened since then? You, you mentioned that you have some subsequent movies that came out, but have any of them been, any of these ceremonial stone landscapes been preserved? Has any um, have any areas been cordoned off? Uh, uh, have has there been uh, progress? Uh, in the preservation of these um, these structures, I wonder. I wonder if there's been some some good that's come out of it in that regard. Well, you remember in the middle of Great Falls, we broke it right in the middle and said that 
the National Register uh, has actually set aside for the first time in the New England region, they've, they've qualified a native ceremonial site uh, as a potential National Register site. Now, that was the goal of the movie, one of the goals of the movie. Um, and it was the movie that convinced the National Register that they should preserve the Turner's Falls site. And, and that was because we had never reached out for, to Native voices like we did with the, the head of the Narragansett Medicine Man, the, the medicine woman from the Narragansett, uh, Doug Harris from the Narragansett and, and, other, and in the other movies, there's other people, but in, in the, the um, National Register, they had to run it, they ran a test. This, this might be interesting. In, a few years ago, when the, when the movie was just finishing, uh, they, they, they used the, in, New ha in um, Massachusetts, they put a team of conservative archeologists together to argue against the idea that the Turner Falls site was important. And then they used um, the native voices in the movie to argue against, and they, they do, the, the register does this. They set up opposing teams to argue about what might be, should be preserved. And in our case, we happened to win that argument because of the site of the Turner's Falls, because of the connection. But they used that to say, not only is this site important, but they allowed for the fact that other sites, ceremonial sites might be connected. That was a very big deal for them to recognize that there may be more sites in New England that are connected to a system of these sites. Now, if you go out west to the Zuni or the Navajo or almost any other people out there, it's no big deal. They have connections, they have pathways to the sky, they have all these things uh, that are part of their tradition and preserved and well documented and recognized by archeologists. New England was settled so early and so completely and compromised so deeply that those kinds of things were never recognized because it was politically expedient not to recognize land claims during Puritan times. So there was no, uh, and, and when anthropology began at Yale and Harvard, what did they do? They moved west looking for gold and, and these other elements. Um, they didn't, the archeo few archeologists stayed in New England to research what they thought was dead civilizations or, or, or they didn't even call them civilizations if you go far enough back. Um, so, all of that um, was changed, I suppose, or we hope, when it, through the use of the movie documenting N Native peoples telling their story, it was strong enough to counteract or equate or equal uh, the archaeologists who had held sway for the last 200 years and controlled the story. It was now a, a, a more on the table kind of thing where, they, where finally a site and, a, and they recognize a series of sites might actually be native and older. It put our Northeast at least at the beginning of the threshold of uh, thinking with, maybe we were no less than any of the other native cultures around North America and probably South America, but we know, we know less uh, there, I suppose. Uh, but that was just the step. So the movie uh, was that breakthrough. It was the proof in the movie that we, the assembled evidence in the movie that worked to get the National Register to say, okay, this place could qualify to be on the National Register. You know, we almost could have quit 
then. It wouldn't have made, it still wouldn't have changed things because it still would be a repressed kind of thing because development does not necessarily want to know that these places may be valuable for other purposes than building houses or whatever. Um, so uh, that's, that's, that's in the middle and that's, and that's how something happened anyway. And, and hopefully not, I, like I say, the, the, the numbers of audience for these movies, especially since they're now six or, you know, God knows we're working on many different things. The first one was the mystery of the lost red paint people. It was on Nova, which was the first uh, introduction to a lost civilization of Eastern native seagoing people. And that was in 1980. That was on TV. And I've, I've just found that it's this, this topic was more interesting than practically anything else I could work on. I've just, it's for me, it's been the most fun I could have, especially since the scientists were willing to humor me and the native people were willing to allow me. Uh, and if, if I could walk that tightrope between those two groups, I could get stories from either side that mixed, that fit. And I could put them into a movie and not put it into a scientific paper, which I did not have the qualification to do, but I did have the qualification to make an, a story that, that people, not everybody, but many people, I hope like yourselves, uh, could appreciate. And so it's this, the audience is built just as quietly as this one, very slowly. Nolan Bika ran all four of them a few months ago. And it was a, a wonderful surprise for everybody uh, and the certain happiness and in a sense it gets out there. But everybody then with that information went out and started chasing their own crusades, which I suppose is what all of this is supposed to do. Ted, this is fantastic. Um, we only have a few more minutes and so I wanna start getting to some of the questions in the chat that you can't see, but... Um, Andy asked, uh, my only critique of the film was that you showed pictures of different sachems. Different what? Sorry. What's the, how do you say it? Sachems? Um, but, sachems? But as I understand it, there are no contemporary depictions of what these people looked like. Did you consider saying they were no. artists? Yes, those are, there's, a, there's an artist, uh, a wonderful artist uh, by the name of David Wagner. He, he lives in Eastern Connecticut. He has painted native uh, subjects, and um, I, you could call him an illustrator. Uh, an art, it, he is, is a gentleman who, I don't exactly know how he does it, but he's, he's, he's read his history, he's got his information, and he's conjured up these images of who these historical figures are, so that somebody has something to go on. I couldn't, I couldn't convey to an audience, a movie audience, um, who these different characters are, whether it, the, the chiefs or the, the medicine people. He put these together. Now, he did all of this before I met him. He signed over to me the rights to use in my movies all of his illustrations. And you've seen them here, and you would see them in the rest of the movies in the Hidden Landscape series. It is just one of the greatest gifts I've ever received. Um, he sold that entire collection uh, of native material to the Mohicans, Mohegans, excuse me, for a million dollars. But he cut out, as he, did, he gave these to me before he sold them to the Mohegans. So I have the right to use them in my movies. And they have been able to illustrate so many of the things we want to do or in terms of illustration for native life. I've never seen anybody do a better job of illustrating uh, a cross between uh, native life linked to uh, European settlement and native life linked to the past. His imagination, I mean, you have to go to an artist if you want to get to that past. I mean, you, you, you can go into a museum and you can see bits and pieces of things, but you need a good artist to give you a chance to give you an image to look at while you hear other stuff. And he's, I think, excellent at giving us that 
passing image. Is it absolutely correct? Uh, it's, it's an artist's image, but he has a gift that I've never seen before for getting the right characters listed into his, into his, uh, his little pantheon of native history. And, and then if the, if the, if the Mohegans are willing to give him a million dollars for those paintings, then, you know, they must appreciate them too, which is probably the bottom line for us to say, I guess it's okay. <laughs> right. Um, another question, Michelle asks, did you work on the film simultaneously? Did insights from working on one film influence what you then uh, did with yes. the other film? Uh, actually, they weren't finished exactly in the order that they're presented. I mean, Great Falls is first in the series, uh, but it was, uh, the, it was second. It, we had to wait for the National Register to go through this business of having these debates and ha you know and have balancing out the the uh, opinions of the natives with the scientists in Massachusetts and things like that. Um, the first movie was was the was the Champlain, uh, this, which is the second film in the series. I was filming these things willy nilly for years and years, and not realizing how they fit together till I did more and more research and then could see the links. It just took decades to be able to get the links or the people who could make the links substantially in place to turn the stories around. And then the government asked me to join and the tribes together asked me to get offshore with their, with their research on the, on the continental shelf uh, as they were looking for sites offshore. It was the very logical step from laying out the potential for ceremonial sites on land, particularly the ones in Labrador that are seven, 8,000 years old, they have risen, as you, as, you, as you know, they went up and that's why they're preserved at, from 8,000 years ago, even though they're high up above the shoreline. Um, below, uh, the St. Lawrence, actually below halfway in Maine, the shore is, shoreline's been sinking. So there's, at least according to the scientists I interviewed, there's no doubt that they were making ceremonial sites on the land that was exposed during the Ice Age, and that land dipped down when the other land went up. So underwater, we should be able to find the sites. Uh, the scientists who actually work underwater are quick to tell you that a lot of stuff has been washed away, but not everything. There are plenty of places that have been covered over with silt and preserved. And when we are going out there, putting down hundreds and hundreds of wind turbines into the ocean floor, the law says we have to look first for cultural resources. This is a big deal. The scientists would never get the opportunity to do that kind of a survey on the ocean floor if they don't closely follow where they put the wind turbines all up and down the Atlantic coast on the Atlantic shelf. That's the last movie. That's what it's all about. And, and, and what all of those elements are. So it, there's a progression to go to that, but the order only came when in the editing for the last five years of the whole process. And, and it, you know, I started in 75 with my first introduction to these stone ruins, these mysterious stone ruins, and what on earth could they be? Is that even half an answer? <laughs> Amazing. Um, so this is a comment, I guess, but you might have, you might want to comment back. <laughs> um, Shell says, um, or Dina says, that one of the things that really struck me in the movie was how far the regional trade was routinely going. Eastern Rhode Island is nowhere near the Adirondacks, wildly different ecosystems and cultures. Of course, even the history we are given in school shows that ancients in many parts of the world had extensive trade networks and were far less parochial than our typical image. And then he adds, he would think there would be federal and or academic money to explore something as fundamental as a strong claim that native people were here in New England 27,000 years ago. Well, it's, it's 
practically brand new news, for one thing. Although it's been suspected, I mean, these things have been found, uh, but debunked. Uh, but the, this one's actually more solid discovery, at least for the moment. Um, but that led me to this. Uh, can you paraf- get get the, give me the, the the last part of what that was again? Because uh, I want. Yeah, that um, basically shouldn't there be academics and federal money to looking into this idea? Is that the part you meant? Uh, in the beginning, you told me you told you about the, the the spread of of these artifacts. Yeah, from like Eastern Rhode Island yeah. to there's, Adirondack. There is a wonderful section in this last uh, Atlantic uh, movie where Doug Harris has brought in a Micmac from uh, Newfoundland, uh, Nova Scotia, excuse me, and this Micmac had Cree uncles around Hudson Bay. And they told him a story about how the Cree would uh, come down to the Great Lakes and trade for big sea canoes from the Ojibwe on the Great Lakes. They would trans across the Great Lakes up the St. Lawrence to uh, to Micmac territory. And they, they, this, this storyteller says they asked permission everywhere they went and they would take, they would take local people to translate language to language. But he, he, in Micmac country, they would do ceremony. Uh, and then they would continue all the way down the Atlantic coast of Florida. They would go around Florida and they would go back up the Mississippi. And you have to remember that one of the things we learned is that uh, before uh, boat travel on our American rivers like the Mississippi, they were much higher because all over the east and, and all through the river systems, beaver dams were retaining huge amounts of water back up so that there were much uh, larger pools of water held up by dams on all of the rivers and lakes that connected. So you could easily go from the Great Lakes to the, the uh, larger streams that fed into the Ohio and, and the Mississippi. So it was not a problem to circumnavigate the entire east, eastern half of the United States. And this, this native uh, uh, story, he's not a storyteller, he was the actual preservation officer for Micmac at the time that he was uh, recorded. Um, he told the story of this entire loop of trading and ceremony around the entire thing. So uh, that's how uh, shells from the Gulf of New Mexico or uh, the, the Gulf of Mexico actually made it into the Great Lakes, which they've always found in the mound builders. There were these, you know, and it seemed like such a rare exotic thing, but, but it was done by water. These things were all carried by water uh, for the most part, I assume, because that's the easiest thing to do and people will do the easiest thing they can. So that's just one more story. And I urge you to, if you get a chance to see the other movies, because um, that's uh, they're just story after story. Once you've had Great Falls and you and you see the basis for Eastern Native peoples not being the backwater of all of Native America, once you get a grounding in that possibility and you see the potential of their architecture and how it goes back thousands of years, it can lead you easily to the idea that all of that must exist offshore for 400 miles. And what's out there? What do you think uh, it could be found if um, we actually looked hard? Uh, and we're going to have to look if we're gonna dig it up for oil and, ga- and, and wind. Uh, and we just have to make sure we're on top of that politically so that we do get the chance to find it. Terrific. <laughs> experience and knowledge you share with us we're getting lots and lots of chats about um how people are really impressed with this information that they did not learn in school (laughs) so um you'll have to read the chat when we finally stop um and uh i think uh we have time for one more question so um um Wait and see if anyone wants to unmute and ask a question or put it in the chat. Get rid of those little red spots. 
I mean, what have you seen um, as helpful to the cause of awareness um, generating in other communities? I mean, we're just one. Um, we're working on the topic of um, of uh, of race and racism at large, and looking at lots of different ways that that plays out in society. Oh yeah, but. But what have others done, and uh, how how they've been help how have they been helpful to your uh, efforts? Towns that have been and, and Doug Harris does a lot of this. Uh, you could have a whole program with him; and it would be very worthwhile. Uh, often we do it together, but then there's there's way too much information for one between the two of us. We can't get the, there's there's two sides. There's this. The, the, the native side, and then there's the non-native side. So um, we, he uh, it works with towns who have these ruins in them at preserving them. Mm-hmm. And there, he also works with the United South and Eastern Tribes, which is all of the Eastern Tribes of North America, building the protocols for protection of different sites. And when a town realizes that they may have a ceremonial site, they become really interested in preserving it because it's a great uh, piece of emotional connection to your landscape. And I, this is something that, we, that is, I think is important to give everyone that the sense that what happens when you begin to learn about the native connection to these ceremonial places and you go visit them yourself, you build an emotional connection to them that marries the environmental issues that we're all worried about. Everything from too much (laughs) pollution to uh, especially to the idea of preservation of these things and overdevelopment. It is, to me, it's very interesting to have a native ceremonial, uh, whether you, uh, firmly want to be a convert or something is, is certainly up to you. But the idea that there is an emotional connection to the environmental side of this history makes it easier to put a, a humanity on the idea of environmental protection. It, it gives you a face, even a, a cultural face, uh, because you know people have been responsive to these landscapes for a long time, to these environments for a long time, thousands of years. It somehow, in my mind, brings the whole question of environmental preservation to a new level of emotional commitment. It's not just, we may not survive, not that you need much more commitment than that, I realize, but to have an actual history so that you can go to a place like this. And many, many people go to these places and have experiences. They just simply feel it. Um, And hopefully these places won't be lost. They'll be remembered, preserved, and for however it trickles down to people after us and next generations, the fact that we can remember it and preserve it and document it as best we can, because many things get, just in my lifetime, things have been lost that you wouldn't believe. And they're still going to be lost because the best places are still out there and they're the places you people want to build their big houses in. Uh, so that, that is the moral to the story. If you have an emotional connection, even if it's an environmental, emotional, spiritual connection, that's a three-legged stool that stands pretty solidly. And you can base preservation on that. There's something in there for many, many different people coming from many different perspectives. Thank you for that. Um, I think that um, I, I'm going to just put out there if there are if there's anyone watching who has a ceremonial stone landscape in their backyard or on their 800 acres that we don't know about, just you know, contact us because I want to see. Yes. And we'll, we'll have a in real life event and um, gather some folks to come look. I think that would be really fun. Well, so. I'll introduce you to Doug Harris, and I think he would be happy to show you some that are being preserved uh, by communities who are, you know, quite stalwart about their protection. And it's setting up models. So we only have models 
to do it. We, we are preserving things, but once you've got a model, more communities discover it and, and you can go from there. Um, I hope you'll think about looking at uh, another movie and we can continue this conversation with what you might learn uh, in another installment, so to speak. That's pretty terrific. Please do, um, let's connect offline on that and talk about our next several series.